بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله Brothers, sisters, elders, respected guests I greet you with the warmest Islamic greetings of peace Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh as you all know, that means may the peace and blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala of God be upon you all. So, what are the two main aspects of Abraham, Ibrahim alayhi salam that I want to focus on today? The first aspect is that Ibrahim alayhi salam expressed the self-evident truth that Allah exists and that he deserves to be worshipped. Let me repeat, Ibrahim alayhi salam, Abraham expressed, just like all the messengers and the prophets, that there is no deity worthy of worship but the deity, but Allah. Okay, this was very, very important for us to understand. This is very important for us to understand. So Ibrahim, Abraham, upon whom be peace, expressed the self-evident truth that there is a creator and he deserves to be worshipped. Here's my proof from the Islamic point of view. Allah says, God says in the Quran in chapter 14 verses 9 to 10, Has there not reached you the news of those before you, the people of Noah and Ad and Thamud and those after them? No one knows them but Allah. And listen to this very important point. Their messengers brought them clear proofs but they returned their hands to their mouths and said, Indeed, we disbelieve in that with which you have been sent, and indeed we are about that to which you invite us in disquieting doubt. So the polytheists, when their messengers came to teach them about this self-evident truth that Allah exists and He deserves to be worshipped, they said, we are in, in doubt about what you're saying. And Allah says what the messengers were saying. Their messengers answered, Can there be any doubt about God Allah, the creator of the heavens and the, and the earth? He calls you to Him in order to forgive you your sins and let you enjoy your life until the appointed hour. So the messengers and the prophets, what were they saying? Is there any doubt in the creator of the heavens and the earth? Almost like balagha, a which means rhetoric, a rhetorical ploy to say, is there really any doubt? Allah's not asking a question. He's not saying that the prophets asked the question, oh, is there a doubt in God and, that he, and the fact that he deserves to be worshipped? No, it's a rhetorical ploy. Is there any doubt? Is there any doubt in God, the creator of the heavens and the earth, and that he deserves to be worshipped? So Allah, what is God saying to us? He's saying that the prophets had this self-evident, unquestionable awakening that Allah exists and He deserves to be worshipped. This is so important because it teaches us that our tradition does not start with doubt. It doesn't start with doubt. In actual fact, if you start with doubt, you'll never have knowledge. Because if your foundation is doubt, you're always going to end up in doubt. So from this perspective, Allah is saying the messengers, and by extension the prophets, and all of them, they had this self-evident conviction that there's no doubt about the existence of Allah, and there's no doubt that He deserves to be worshipped. This was a key feature of the teachings of Ibrahim alayhi salam, of Abraham upon whom be peace. So that's the first aspect of his life. Self-evident truth that God exists and that He deserves worship. Second aspect that we're going to elaborate on. Ibrahim alayhi salam had intellectual rhetoric. Ibrahim alayhi salam, Abraham had a form of intellectual rhetoric. Meaning he was able to formulate arguments in a way to convince others about the doubt, that they're really in doubt, there's nothing certain about denying Allah. And to convince others that Allah exists and He deserves to be worshipped. We all know this famous story. And I'm going to say what the Quran says right now. When the night covered him over, he saw a star. He said, this is my Lord. But when it set, he said, I love not those that set. 
When he saw the moon rising in splendor, he said, this is my Lord. But when the moon set, when it disappeared, he said, unless my Lord guide me, I shall surely be among those who go astray. When he saw the sun rising in splendor, he said, this is my Lord. This is the greatest of all. But when the sun set, he said, oh, my people, I am indeed free from your guilt of giving partners with Allah, of associating partners with Allah. For me, I have set my face firmly and truly towards him who created the heavens and the earth and never shall I give partners to Allah. Some people misunderstand these verses. They think that Abraham was in doubt. They think that Abraham was actually questioning whether Allah existed and questioning to what thing he should worship. Should he worship the sun, the moon or the star? Abraham here was not in doubt because if you read the verses before, you see Abraham challenging polytheism, challenging the denial of Allah. Many of the ulama, many of our scholars say that these verses was Abraham's rhetorical intellectual response to the polytheists, putting himself in the position saying, well, you know, Look, the sun is so amazing. I don't worship the sun. No, how can I do that? That's such a silly thing because it sets. Things that set are contingent. They're dependent. They have limited physical features. The creator of the heavens and the earth is not contingent. Is not dependent. He is independent. He is necessary. Right? So from this point of view, Abraham didn't have doubt. I don't want you to think, oh, you know, the prophets had doubt and he, he was convincing himself. That is not the position that many of the ulama take. The position they take, if you look at all the verses surrounding these verses, is that Abraham was using this as a rhetorical intellectual ploy to basically convince them that you're on the wrong path, which is you are worshipping limited dependent things, whereas you should be worshipping the one who is independent, free of all need. So these are the two aspects of Abraham that we can use and develop further today in order for us to basically learn the right tools to articulate Islam to others and also to ourselves. So let's start with the first aspect, that there is no doubt. The messengers, including Abraham, the prophets, including Abraham, Ibrahim alayhi salam, upon whom be peace, had no doubt in the existence of Allah and the fact that he deserves to be worshipped. To the point, Allah rhetorically tells us that the messenger said, is there a doubt in the creator of the heavens and the earth? Meaning it's unquestionable. It's unquestionable. It's self-evidently true. And what we mean by self-evident means true by default. True by default. So what I want to show you now is that when someone says to you, does God exist? You don't jump and say, let me give you all of this evidence. You teach them that they're asking the wrong question. We need to learn to turn the tables. Why do you think intellectually you have to be on the back foot all the time? Just like a boxer, he's on the, on the ropes, right? And he has to defend himself. No, we stay in the middle of the ring and we keep our intellectual ground because we have the correct basis, we have the correct set of ideas, we have the correct world view. And this is very significant for us to understand. We always quickly say, oh, let's answer the question, bro. He said, where's your evidence for God? Hold on a second. We have lots of evidence, but we need to teach people how to think. And this is a very important strategy in how to articulate Islam to human beings. Because sometimes we want to give people answers all the time. It's like a form of ego, isn't it? Oh, I've got the answer, bro. Let me give it to him. No, sometimes we have to use our spiritual insight and wisdom. Sometimes the best thing you can do to your fellow human being is to get them to think. Don't give them answers all the time. Just like, you know, the villagers who are very, very poor. Don't give them fish. Teach them how to fish. If you give them fish, then you're going to run out of fish because you can't answer all the questions, right? But if you teach them how to fish, from our point of view, teach them how to think, then whatever question comes along, at least they'll be able to answer it. And by Allah, this is a Quranic strategy. How many times in the Quran do we find questions and we don't find answers? 
How many times in the Quran? For example, chapter 52, verse 35 to 36. Did you come from nothing? Did you create yourself? Did you create the heavens and the earth? Indeed, they have no certainty. <laughs> Where's the answer? There's no direct answer. Allah is teaching us. You, you ask these questions. And if you're sincere, inevitably it would lead to the right answer. So from a Quranic point of view, what's very deep and profound is the Quran teaches us how to think by asking these questions even in a rhetorical way. So it awakens within us this idea that, okay, this is a new question. Let me think about it. So it's very important for us not to be on the intellectual back foot. So let me start with a story. Now, by the way, this is not a shameless plug. Well, it might be, but everything I'm saying is from chapter 4 and 6 from my book called The Divine Reality, God, Islam and the Mirage of Atheism, okay? So I want to start this part, this aspect of the life of Abraham concerning self-evident truths with a little bit of a scenario, a little bit of a story. I'm going to read it from my book, it's only one or two paragraphs, and then I'm going to explain what is meant by this. So this is from chapter 4. I know you guys love stories, so listen to this. Imagine one evening you receive a call from David, one of your old school friends you used to sit next to during science lessons. You haven't spoken to him for years, but you remember the weird questions he used to ask you. Although you found him pleasant, you were not a fan of his ideas. Reluctantly, you answer the phone. After a brief exchange of greetings, he invites you to have lunch with him. You half-heartedly accept his invitation. During lunch, he asks, Can I tell you something? You reply positively. And he begins to express to you something that you haven't heard before. You know, the past, like what you did yesterday, last year, and all the way back to your birth, didn't really happen. It's just an illusion in your head. So my question to you is, do you believe the past exists? As a rational person, you do not agree with his assertion and you reply, what evidence do you have to prove that the past does not exist? Now rewind the conversation and imagine you spent the whole meal trying to prove that the past is something that really happened. Which scenario do you prefer? The first scenario or the second scenario? Give me an answer. Do you prefer the scenario where I respond to his claim by basically saying, what evidence do you have to prove that the past never existed? Or do you prefer the scenario where I spend my whole lunch with him trying to prove that the past did exist? Which scenario is more intellectually sound for you? The first one, right? So why do we sit with some atheists and spend months and years and decades debating with them about the existence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Is the existence of God less certain than the existence of the past? Do you see the point I'm trying to make here? The point I'm trying to make here is David in this story was challenging Something that was true by default, meaning it was self-evidently true. From our psychological intuitions, we know the past existed. Five minutes ago existed. It was once real. Five days ago once existed. <laughs> Many of us have white beards in this room. We know the past existed, right? And may your white beards be shining lights on the Day of Judgment. So from that point of view, we know intuitively there is temporal depth, meaning there is time, it happened, the past is real. But David is saying to me, no, it's not real. The universe was just created five minutes ago, for example, with, with all of your ideas and memories built into you. You're not going to accept that because it's going against a self-evident truth. So the onus of proof is on me or David? It's on David. David has to prove his assertion that the past wasn't real, never existed. It would be absurd for me to sit there and to prove to him that actually, let me give you some evidence why the past existed. 
This is no different, no different from the discussion about God's existence. And I'm going to explain why. But before I do that, let me just give you a little few more concepts about what I mean by self-evident truths. So we said a self-evident truth is something that is true by default. Now, it doesn't mean self-evident truths are always going to be the same. They may change. I'm up, I'm up to that kind of scenario, right? Self-evident truths may change over time. However, the default position is when something is true by default, you accept it unless there's direct evidence to challenge it. Okay? Now, one may ask, Hamza's making this up, man. He's making this up. He's playing trickery, creating this idea of self-evident truth in order to fudge God into the equation, right? What is this self-evident truth? He's making it up just so he could create some kind of fake confidence in Muslims. Hold on a second. Let's turn down the arrogance knob a little bit. Self-evident truths permeate every single field of philosophy, science, mathematics, Western thought. Let me repeat. The idea of things being true by default, things being self-evidently true, permeate all aspects of thinking, even science itself. I know. I just finished studying two postgraduate degrees in philosophy and we did philosophy of science, we did philosophy of psychology, we did the philosophy of language, we did all of these things and I'm telling you, you would realize that there are things that are considered true by default, that don't need any proof, that they start with in order to develop their knowledge further. Take for example, my specialist module called the idea of freedom, it was political philosophy. And we had a postgraduate discussion. In the seminar period, you have discussions with your fellow postgrads, and you have a bit of a debate and a discussion. And the discussion was on the idea of hurriya, freedom, right? And there was two opinions that freedom is intrinsic, meaning it doesn't need, you don't need any evidence that freedom is like a virtue, something that we should work towards. But others said, no, freedom is only good because it's instrumental. It's a means to an end. So some philosophers would argue freedom is an end. Others would argue it's a means to an end. And I asked the question, and because the majority of them believe that freedom is, is, has intrinsic value, meaning it's an end, it's not just a means. And, I, and therefore it doesn't really need proof from that point of view because it's intrinsically valuable. So I said to them, well, how do you know? Well, he said, well, for me to start to prove it means that freedom is not intrinsically valuable anymore. I said, yeah, but you must have a basis for this. And this is what the professor, the academic said. He said, it's based on our intuitions. And then I said to him, really? And he replied, what else do we have? His intuition. His intuition, fair enough. But the point I'm trying to say, even in political philosophy, things like freedom and other concepts and ideas are based on what they would consider true by default. That trusting your intuition is true by default from, from this point of view. Take, for example, things in the philosophy of science. If you study the philosophy of science, for some <laughs> conceptions of the scientific method, you have to have something that you believe to be true by default. What is that thing? That the real world exists. This bottle really exists. It's outside of my head. This bottle is not just an idea here, it's outside of my head. I'm touching it and I'm feeling it. You have to start with that position. Because after all, there is no real proof that this bottle is external to my brain. But you'd be like, but I can see it bro. And you can touch it and feel it, fair enough, but it could just be all an idea in my head. Maybe my mind is on planet Mars, and there are metal probes in my brain, and there's an alien making me think and feel what I'm thinking and feeling now. I don't know if you guys ever watched the film The Matrix. <laughs> Maybe we're in The Matrix, right? Where are you going to take, the blue pill or the red pill? The point I'm trying to say here is they have to work with that true by default assumption, the self-evident truth, that the external world exists. Not only that, in the philosophy of science, and you could read this for yourself, a true by default self-evident truth is that 
external causal connections exist. So there are things that happen in the world and they're causally connected. Another true by default assumption or self-evident truth in the philosophy of science is that nature is uniform. Nature is uniform. Like if you see a certain pattern, it's more likely to repeat itself across reality. So the point is, there are self-evident truths in philosophy of politics, in philosophy of science. Also, even in metaphysics, the idea that we have minds. Do you have a mind, bro? Do you have a mind? You think so? Well, the minute you say, I think, you have a mind, <laughs> right? You must have a mind. So this guy has a mind. I want him to prove to us he has a mind. How do we know you're not just a zombie, bro, that you've been programmed biologically like this? <laughs> I think they thought therefore I am. But maybe you've been programmed to say I think therefore I am. Do I have another mind? Do I have a mind? I know. The point is, we all believe that we all have minds, right? But we don't have any what, what you would call absolute proof that this guy is really a human being, being with another mind. He may be a, just a biological zombie, and I'm the only one with a mind. This is called solipsism, right? The point I'm trying to say here is, we use that as an assumption. In metaphysics, when you're studying consciousness, right? You assume everyone has minds. And you take that as true by default. So the point I'm trying to say here, brothers and sisters, is that this idea of self-evident truth, this idea of being true by default, is not something I've made up. It exists everywhere. Everywhere. In science, in politics, in philosophy, in mathematics even. If you study, for example, the philosophy of mathematics, in when they do set theory or calculus, there is an assumption that they believe is true by default. What's that assumption? Infinity exists. No evidence. They just say it exists. They have to start with that in order to have their mathematical knowledge. So don't think this is just Muslims trying to grasp by intellectual straws. It exists everywhere. Self-evident truths, things being true by default, things having assumptions, exist everywhere. So, when someone challenges that there are human beings with no minds, and they are the only ones with a mind, they're challenging a self-evident truth. So they have to give us evidence. If someone, for example, challenges that the real world exists and it's external to our minds, we're not going to sit there starting to prove that the real world actually does exist. We're going to ask them, where is their evidence? So when someone challenges a self-evident truth, the onus of proof is on them. Now, there are four characteristics of self-evident truths. Listen to this very carefully. Four characteristics. Characteristic number one, it is universal. It is not a product of a particular culture, and it is cross-cultural. For example, the idea that the past was once the present, the idea that the past existed, is not a product of one culture. For example, you don't find a tribe in, say, Kenya, only having this idea. And the origin is just from that tribe, and everyone else disagrees with them, or they borrowed knowledge just from that tribe. When we look cross-culturally, we understand that there is pattern going on that people actually believe that the past did exist. It's not based on a specific culture. It doesn't mean everyone has to agree with this. Of course not. But it's, from, it's not from a particular culture, it's cross-cultural. Characteristic of a self-evident truth number two. It's not based on information transfer. It's not acquired via knowledge external to your introspection and external to your senses. For example, I believe the past was once the present. I believe the past was real. I never learned this at home. I never learned this at school. When was the last time you went into school? Primary school, secondary school, college, university, whatever. And you sit down and the teacher says to you, Hamza, today's lesson is going to be on that yesterday was real. Yesterday once happened, Hamza. Two weeks ago, once happened. 
it was real. It was once the present. <laughs> right? You don't learn that at school, do you? Who learns that at school? Nobody. Because it's true by default. You acquire it by your own senses and your own introspection. So things being true by default, things being self-evidently true, are not based on information transfer. No one teaches to you, it to you. You don't acquire this externally. Rather, rather, you acquire it within yourself, introspection and your senses. The third characteristic of a self-evident truth. It is natural. It is formed due to the natural functioning of the human psyche. Meaning, it is the most kind of direct appreciation of reality. Our psychological disposition almost immediately appreciates it. The fourth, the fourth and final characteristic of a self-evident truth is that it is intuitive. What do I mean by this? I mean it is the easiest, most simple and comprehensive explanation. I repeat, the fourth characteristic of things being self-evidently true is that they are intuitive. They are the easiest, most simple and comprehensive explanation of reality. For example, when someone denies the past that it never existed, we just were created five minutes ago with all of these memories, that is not a simple explanation of reality, right? It is not the easiest explanation of reality and it's not the most comprehensive. Why? Because it raises far more questions than you can solve. Because you now have to deny your own psychological disposition, you have to deny your own personal and social experiences, you have to deny all of these memories that you have in your head. So it being intuitive, a self-evident truth has to be intuitive from the point of view that it's the most easiest, simple and comprehensive explanation of reality. Because things that deny self-evident truths, they're not simple. They create far more questions, right? If I were to say I'm the only one with a mind in this room, that's not an easy, simple and comprehensive explanation because now I have to justify why you don't have a mind and you don't have a mind and you don't have a mind. It creates far more problems than it solves. So those are the four key characteristics of self-evident truths. Let's apply these four key characteristics on the existence of a creator. Let's see if it works. Let's see if a creator, the idea of a creator is a self-evident truth. It's true by default. And by the way, when I say a creator here, I'm meaning the basic underlying concept of a creator. The basic underlying concept of a creator. That things require causal conditions. Things require prior causal conditions. I'm not talking about God and his name is Allah and one of his names is Al-Wudud and Al-Rahman. No, we need revelation for this, right? We need revelation for this. What I'm talking about is the basic underlying concept of a creator that things require causal conditions, prior causal conditions. So let's apply this idea of self-evident truths, the four characteristics of self-evident truths to God himself, the underlying basic concept of God. Number one, is the creator of the heavens and the earth a creator, a universal truth? Yes or no? Of course it is. I don't care if there's half a billion atheists in the world or a billion atheists in the world. This is not a consensus, right? It's not a popularity vote. When we talk about something being universal, we're not saying every single human being agrees with this. No, we already defined it. We're saying it's not the product of one specific culture. The existence of a creator and even the idea of things requiring causes is everywhere. It's cross-cultural. Things requiring prior causal conditions, things requiring a creator, something coming to effect as a result of a causal condition or a creative power. This idea is cross-cultural. It doesn't belong to the Chinese. It doesn't belong to the Arabs. It doesn't belong to the Scandinavian people. It doesn't belong to us Brits. It's cross-cultural. So, so far, so good. One out of four. Second characteristic. Let's apply this to God. The basic underlying concept of God. Untaught. Is the basic underlying concept of God, as we just discussed, untaught? Of course it is. I'm telling you, I never went to school, college or university, and one of the teachers, professors or academics came up to me and said, Hamza, 
when you push this bottle, it's going to move or fall because there is such a thing as cause and effect. For it to fall, there must have been the prior causal condition, the prior causal condition of your hand moving. That causal connection, right, wasn't taught to me. It was based on my introspection and my experiences as a human being. When I heard a noise, I know it's as a result of something. Either someone knocking something down, the wind moving, something happened for there to be a noise. When we hear knocks on the door as children, we know it's as a result of someone knocking the door, something knocking the door, or an accident, or someone throwing a pebble. Whatever the case may be, we know that it's based on prior causal conditions. The effect required some type of cause. And when we see things come into existence that we've never seen before, we immediately say that that had some kind of creative power behind it. I passed a few roundabouts coming to Cambridge, and if I saw an arrangement of flowers that said, I love you, I'm going to obviously come to the conclusion there must have been some kind of creative power. It could have even been the wind. Let's even say it could have been, you know, some kind of random uh, hypothesis like, you know, it, it was the wind doing it, which is obviously ridiculous, but it was something. The idea here is there is some kind of innate logical formula in our minds that when we see things come into existence or things have some kind of formulation that we know there are prior causal conditions or prior causal power or prior creative power we don't learn this at school it's based on our introspection and our direct experiences so it's not based on external knowledge two out of four so far let's go to the third one it's natural it, the basic idea of a creator is based on the normal functioning psychology of a human being, right? So the underlying basic concept of a creator, things requiring causes, is based on the natural functioning of a human being. Our psychology accepts this. It's a direct appreciation of reality. And here's the proof. When you study philosophy and people even deny causality, they have to write a hell of a lot. And they have to be very convincing. <laughs> That's the proof that it's not a natural product of the human being. You have to really do some intellectual gymnastics to try and prove, well, that's not really cause and effect. Because there are some who believe that cause and effect doesn't really exist, right? You know, it doesn't really exist. This is a huge topic in metaphysics. In actual fact, they haven't solved the problem on causality, right? But the underlying concept is there. The underlying concept is there. So, you know, it's a natural product. It's a product of a natural, a, a natural functioning of the human psyche. So I would say believing in causes and effects, things require prior causal conditions, prior creative power. This is part of a natural functioning human psyche. So three out of four. Last one. Intuitive. Is a creator a cause, a prior creative power, the most simple, easiest, and comprehensive explanation for reality. Absolutely. Think about it. If I said there was a creator that created the whole universe, right? It's simple. One creator, right? Create the whole universe. Simple. It's easy to understand. Yep, there was a prior creative power. And it's very comprehensive. It answers the questions. For example, why are we here? <laughs> why is reality the way that it is? Why is there something rather than nothing? If you remove the creator out of the, equation, out of the equation, you have so many questions you can't answer. Because you have to fall back on another position, which is, well, this whole universe came from nothing. <laughs> right? Which creates far more problems than it solves. So what you should understand by now, brothers and sisters and friends, is that the existence of God, the underlying concept of a creator, is a self-evident truth, which means it's true by default. So when someone wants to challenge a self-evident truth, when someone wants to challenge a self-evident truth, who has to bring the proof? The one who's challenging a self-evident truth? Or the one who's listening to the challenge? So who has to bring the proof? The one who challenges the self-evident truth. So the next time you hear on YouTube, that you hear on Google, or see on Google, 
that you hear at school, university, or you read in the popular magazines and books, the question, does God exist? Know for sure that that is not the default position. The default position is that the Creator exists. If you deny this, you're denying a self-evident truth. And the one who denies a self-evident truth, the onus of proof is on them. You're turning the tables. This doesn't mean we don't have evidence. Of course we have evidence. But it shows that we have the strongest intellectual position of starting with certainty and the strongest intellectual position that our ideas and concepts are true by default. They're self-evidently true. So to challenge them, the one who's making the challenge needs to bring the evidence. Does this make sense? Please apply this in your life. Personally, to resolve any doubts, and also socially when you articulate a compassionate and intelligent case for Islam to the wider community. Because one of our biggest problems when it comes to the atheist and skeptic movement is that we fall for the trap. Oh my God, I need to bring all this evidence. Hold on a second. Question the question. Question the question. Ask them. That's a valid question. But let me humbly ask you this. If you challenge the self-evident truth, and there are many self-evident truths in mathematics and philosophy and science, who do you think should be providing the evidence? You making the challenge or the one who's listening to the challenge? It's obviously you making the challenge because you're challenging something that is true by default. Your question about God is no different because that basic underlying concept of a creator or a prior creative power cause is actually true by default. So the onus of proof is on you. This doesn't mean I don't have evidence, I do. But I would like to ask you, what evidence do you have to deny the divine? And this is a stronger position. Much stronger position to take it. It gets them to think, yeah, why am I denying the divine? Because don't forget, we believe in the Islamic tradition that the concept of God, believing in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and believing that He deserves to be praised and worshipped is part of who you are. It's ingrained in your fitrah. Famous hadith in the authentic narrations of Muslim where the Prophet said that every human being is born on a state of fitrah, upon fitrah, fatara, fatrun, fatarahu. Something has been created within us to acknowledge the divine and worship him. And then the Prophet taught us, however, people become Christians and other religions because of their parents. So it's the external sources that affect the fitrah, it becomes clouded. Our job is to awaken the fitrah. When we give da'wah, which means when you talk to people and engage with them, so they could see the truth of Islam, our job is to awaken that truth within. We are here to awaken the truth within. This is why Ibn Taymiyyah said, the affirmation of a creator is firmly rooted in the hearts of all people. It is from the binding necessities of their creation. Also, the famous scholar, the famous scholar Al Asfahani, he said, the knowledge of Allah is firmly rooted in the soul. Al Ghazali also said that the concept of God is part of our nature, part of our natural disposition. And this is why he, towards the end of his life, he made a beautiful point. He basically said that you only give these intellectual ideas and philosophy to someone who's already sick. You don't give medicine to someone who's okay. Because if you take medicine and you don't have, you don't have an illness, it can make you sick. <laughs> right? So he said, you know, you use this type of stuff where, where necessary. So, from this point of view, brothers and sisters and friends, I think we can conclude that the, the underlying concept of God is a self-evident truth, truth. It's true by default. And if someone basically asks the question, to turn the tables and make them understand that if they're challenging a self-evident truth, the onus of proof is on them and make them realize that the underlying concept of God is a self-evident truth based on the four characteristics of self-evident truths. So finally, the second aspect of Ibrahim alayhi salam, the life of Abraham, which was he had intellectual rhetoric. Not only was there that we had a self-evident truth that Allah exists, right? That Abraham was coming across like all the messengers and prophets. Is there any doubt in the creator of the heavens and the earth? Not only did he come across with this self-evident truth with conviction and certainty, 
But he also had a very powerful argument. He had a very powerful argument. And if you remember, it was about things setting. The star sets, the moon sets, the sun sets. These are limited and contingent and dependent. That's not my Lord. My Lord is independent. And this is a summary really of what you call the argument from dependency or also known in the West as the argument from contingency. Why do I like this argument? I love this argument because it is Islamically neutral. So in Islam, there are different schools of creed, okay? And all schools of creeds appreciate this argument. For example, if you study the works of, if you study Aqid al-Tahawiyah, the creed of book of Tahawi, there are different explanations of that book from different schools of creed. If you look into those books, you would see that they refer to this argument in some way. It's a neutral Islamic argument, right? And it's very powerful. The other reason why I love this argument, because you don't have to know anything about science, which is great. We love science, obviously, as Muslims. But if you study the philosophy of science, you know science changes. Because no one has an infinite number of observations. We may have a future observation that is against our previous generalizations. We see this in the history of science all the time. Things are changing. Theories are confirmed or rejected. Theories are improved or tweaked. It happens all the time. If someone st has studied the Darwinian mechanism, Darwinian evolution, you would see throughout its history, although it stayed relatively the same, it's been tweaked here and there, right? Because of new findings and new observations. Even concerning the beginning of the, beginning of the universe, cosmology, the Big Bang as we hear, it gets tweaked all the time. In actual fact, if you study the academia, forget the magazines, there are 17 different models to explain the Big Bang. 17. And I believe all of them disagree with each other. They contra those models are in contradiction with each other. And yet, they have the same weight. This is called in the philosophy of science, under determination. You have some data, and there are 17 ways of explaining the same data. And that's how we have to learn and read, Wallahi, brothers and sisters, by God. Because many of us, we go onto the streets, and we go onto YouTube, and we go into these places, and we think the Big Bang is like a revelation. It's haq. <laughs> you know, there's no other way of looking at reality. The Big Bang, bro, didn't you hear? Dr. So-and-so spoke about this, right? And if he said it, it must be true. And look, the Quran says it true. It, it, the Quran says it as well, and it must be the same. We can't have this anymore. We live in a globalized world. The internet is very, very open for everybody to see. And people will see what you're saying, and they would say, you don't know what you're talking about. And we don't, unfortunately. Don't superimpose science onto the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, especially when we don't know the science. And when you go into the science, it's not even based on anything absolute. As we said, the Big Bang, there are 17 competing different models to explain the same data. But why do we go out there in the public realm and we basically portray ourselves as saying, this Big Bang, this version is absolutely true and my interpretation of these verses are absolutely true. Both is wrong. Both is wrong. And we just have to become more intellectually and spiritually mature in order to understand that. I did those mistakes too. I've gone through this journey. So we have to consult our ulama, our scholars, consult our classical tradition because they were always very wary when people were superimposing science from the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because science is limited knowledge. The book of Allah, the knowledge of Allah is unlimited from that point of view. Allah has the picture, we just have a pixel. Think of a jigsaw puzzle, it's all together. Allah sees the whole picture. We just have one piece. And we think from our arrogance, that that peace is everything. We need to relax. And always say, just like the ulama said, and Allah knows best. Okay? And we have to learn from the mistakes of our predecessors and the mistakes of, of my mistakes and other mistakes that people have had. And we progress and learn together. And what we need to realize when we take something scientific, really understand what it means accurately. Not something from YouTube, not in a popular magazine. And when you read the verses of the Qur'an, understand them properly. And then you could do your own tadabbur, your own pondering. Not tafsir, because we're not qualified. But you could do your own pondering. And when you do that, say Allah knows best. Don't come across as this is 
the only thing you could hold on to to prove your religion. This is totally false based on what I've just said. Science changes. So one of the reasons I like this argument, it, you don't need science. It's based on a metaphysical concepts, meaning it's the way you see the world. Right? You don't have to know how the world works. It's before that. It's based on first principles. It's a very, very powerful argument. So let me start by again going to chapter 6 of my book and reading you a little story to summarize this argument. Then we'll spend the next 10 minutes just breaking it down and then we'll end, inshallah, God willing. Imagine you walk out of your house and on you, and, and, sorry. Imagine you walk out of your house and on your street you find a row of dominoes that stretch far beyond what your eyes can see. You start to hear a noise that gets slightly louder as time passes. This noise is familiar to you as you used to play with dominoes as a child. It is the sound of them falling. Eventually, you see this amazing display of falling dominoes approaching you. You greatly admire how the basic laws of physics can produce such a remarkable spectacle. However, you are also saddened because the last domino has now fallen a few inches away from your feet. Still excited about what has just happened, you decide to walk down the street to find the first domino, hoping to meet the person responsible for producing this wonderful experience. Keeping the above scenario in mind, I want to ask you a few questions. As you walk down your street, will you eventually reach where the chain of dominoes began? Or will you keep on walking forever? The obvious response is that you will eventually find the last domino. Rather, sorry, the first domino. However, I want to ask you why? The reason you know that you will find the first domino is because you understand that if the domino chain went on forever, the last domino that fell by your feet would have never fallen. An infinite number of dominoes will have to fall, would have to fall before the last domino could fall. Yet, an infinite amount of falling dominoes would take an infinite amount of time to fall. In other words, the last domino would never fall. Putting this in simple terms, you know that in order for the last domino to fall, the domino behind must fall prior to it. And for that domino to fall, the domino behind it must fall prior to it. If this went on forever, the domino would never fall. Sticking with this analogy, I want to ask you another question. Let's say walking down the street, you finally come across the first domino, which led to the falling of the entire chain. What would your thoughts be about the first domino? Would you think that this domino fell by itself? In other words, do you think the falling of the domino can somehow be explained without referring to anything external to it? Of course not. Clearly not. That runs against the grain of our basic intuition about reality. Nothing really happens on its own. Everything requires an explanation of some sort. So the first domino's fall had to be triggered by something else. A person, the wind, or a thing hitting it, etc. Whatever this something else is, it has to form a part of our explanation of falling dominoes. So to sum up our reflections thus far, neither could the chain of dominoes contain an infinite number of items, nor could the first domino start for no reason whatsoever. This above analogy is a summary of the argument from dependency, the universe is somewhat like a row of dominoes. And let me explain further why. Here is the basic argument, brothers and sisters and friends. Number one, the universe and everything that we perceive is either independent, dependent on something else dependent, or dependent on something independent. Okay? Number two, the universe and all that we perceive cannot be independent or dependent on something else dependent. Number three, therefore the universe and all that we perceive depends on something independent. 
And if this thing is independent, it has to be eternal, which I'm going to explain later. Now you may think, oh my God, too many dependent, independent. This guy's rapping. It's like a philosophical rap. Let me explain this further to you. The way to understand this is first to define what we mean by dependent. And it's not really in line with the kind of popular use of the term. There is a certain specific understanding of the word dependent in the Islamic classical tradition and also in Western philosophy. The first defining aspect of dependent is that it is not necessary. It is not necessary. Now you may be arguing, well, what does necessary mean? Well, necessary means it was impossible for it to have not existed. Something being necessary means it was impossible for it to have not existed. So things that are not necessary did not have to exist. This is what we mean by dependent. For example, look at this book. Is this book necessary? Was it impossible for it to have not existed? It was possible that it couldn't have been written at all, right? There's nothing necessary about the existence of this book. So what we're saying is this book is not necessary. It didn't have to exist. For example, maybe it could have not been written or I could have forgot it at home. You know, this book that I have right now. There could be a number of different explanations for its existence. So the point here is there is nothing necessary about this book. What we perceive about this book is that it could have not existed. When we perceive this book, we don't come to the conclusion that it was impossible for it to have not existed. There is nothing necessary about this book. Let me give you another example. Imagine you're really hungry at night and you go downstairs to the kitchen and you open the fridge and inside the fridge you have an egg box. And on top of the egg box, you find a pen. Now, let me ask you a question about this egg box and the pen on top of it. Was it impossible for it to have not existed this way? Of course not. It is possible for it to have not existed at all. In actual fact, it could have been arranged in a different way. Why was the pen on top of the egg box and not in the egg box? Right? Why was the pen on top of the egg, bo egg box and not underneath the egg box? In actual fact, why is the pen there at all? In actual fact, why is the egg box there at all? What we perceive about the pen on top of the egg box is that it didn't have to be there. And therefore, it requires an explanation. How did the pen get there? There is an explanation for why the pen is there. There is an explanation for why the egg box is there. So from this point of view, something being dependent means it is not necessary. It is not necessary. It is not necessary from the point of view that it did not have to exist. The pen didn't have to exist on top of the egg box and the egg box didn't have to exist. It could have been there in a different way or it didn't have to be there at all. So first basic definition of what it means to be dependent is that it is not necessary. It could have been otherwise. There is nothing necessary about the existence of these things. They could have not existed at all. Second definition of dependent. The basic components, the basic components or building blocks of something could have been arranged in a different way. So the basic components or building blocks of something could have been arranged in a totally different way. Let me give an example. Back to the same analogy I gave you previously. Imagine I'm driving and I'm driving past a roundabout and on the roundabout it's all grass and there's an arrangement of flowers and the flowers say I love you. I love you. Okay? Now those arrangement of flowers, could they have been arranged in a different way? Of course they could. They could have been arranged I adore you. Right? Or the Greek Say Arabo, I love you. Or the French, je t'aime. I love you, right? Or the Turkish, seni seviorum. I love you. Whatever, it could have been in a different language. It could have been arranged in a different way. There is nothing necessary about that particular arrangement. 
And so what's very interesting here, since it could have been arranged in a different way, there must have been something external to that arrangement that gave rise to the arrangement. There must have been something external to the arrangement that gave rise to that arrangement because there's obviously some kind of choice or there is an alternative option to arrange those flowers in I love you, to arrange those flowers in Se Agabo, in to arrange those flowers in Seni Severum, or to arrange those flowers in Jetem, or to arrange those flowers into I hate you instead of I love you. That could have been a possibility. It could have been arranged in a different way. So it means there must have been something external prior to that arrangement that gave rise to that specific arrangement. So that's the second definition of dependent. Its components or fundamental building blocks could have been arranged in a different way. Third definition of dependent, and this is the most easiest one because this is the natural intuitive understanding of dependent. That something relies on something outside of itself for its existence. Take for example a cat. A cat can, can only survive if it eats food. So it relies on something external, food, in order to stay alive, right? Just like me. I need food, right? Absolutely. I need something external to myself in order to exist. That's a very basic definition of dependency. The other defining feature of what it means to be dependent. This is the final point. Dependent things have limited physical qualities. Dependent things have limited physical qualities. Take this book for example. It has a certain shape, certain size, color, even temperature, right? It's not that cold, right? So it has a limited shape, size, dimension, volume, color, temperature. It has limited physical qualities. Now, if something has limited physical qualities, it can't really give rise to its own limitations. Did this book give rise to its own limitations? Did this book give it itself the color? Did this book give it itself its size? Did this, this book give it itself its temperature? Does this, did this book give itself its dimensions? No. Its limited physical qualities are as a result of something external to it. Because you could always ask the question, why is it this size and not another size? Why is it this color and not another color? Why is it this temperature and not another temperature? We, we need to explain the limited physical qualities of this book. It doesn't explain itself because this book didn't give rise to its own limited physical qualities. There must be something external to it in order to give rise to its limited physical qualities. Even this bottle. Did this bottle give rise to its own limitations, limited physical qualities? Did this bottle give rise to its certain dimension, volume, color, shape, size, temperature? Did it? No. Therefore, there must be something external to it that gave rise to its limited physical qualities. Does that make sense? And that you can apply to anything that has limited physical qualities. Whether it's a bus, a planet, an atom, a quark, a quantum field. Anything physical has limited physical qualities. Therefore, there must be something external to it that gave rise to its limitations because it cannot give itself those limitations. Khalas. Mic drop as they say, yeah? Do you know what that means, mic drop? No? It means you've made a point that no one can refute. <laughs> anyway, that's a youth thing. So, let's apply the definition of dependent that we just discussed to the universe, okay? So let's go back to the argument again. Number one, the universe and all that we perceive, actually we'd even address this, so let's apply it to the universe, yeah? Number one, here is an option. The universe and all that we perceive are eternal, necessary and independent. That's one option. Second option, the universe and all that we perceive depends for its existence on something else which is also dependent. That's an option. Number three, the final option. The universe and all that we perceive is dependent for its existence on something else that exists by its own nature that is accordingly eternal and independent. Let's address each of these options. Number one. 
The universe and all that we perceive are eternal, necessary and independent. What you've learned about the word dependent now, is this true? Why? Exactly! Brilliant! It could have been different. And we even know this in science. Speak to any cosmologist, anyone studying the universe. The universe could have been different. It could have been arranged in a different way. It could have had even different physical laws. Right? There's nothing necessary about the universe itself. There is nothing necessary about the universe itself. And this is very important for us to understand. There's nothing necessary about the universe. It could have been arranged in a different way. Therefore, the universe requires an explanation. Why is the universe the way that it is? In actual fact, this is a key question in cosmology, a key, key question in philosophy. The famous polymath, Leibniz, he said, why is there something rather than nothing? Absolutely. So the universe is not independent because it's dependent because it's not necessary. Also, the universe is dependent because the fundamental, fundamental building blocks of the universe, whether you think it's a quantum field or quantum energy or quantum haze, whatever the science, it's irrelevant. But if you bring something physical into it, it has a particular arrangement. The fundamental building blocks of the universe have particular arrangements. Those arrangements didn't give rise to themselves. There must have been something external to the arrangement that specified that arrangement. It's simple. So again, the universe is dependent. The universe is dependent from that point of view. The universe has limited physical qualities. Even the fundamental building blocks of the universe has limited physical qualities. Whether it's a planet or a quantum field, they have limited physical qualities. And as we discussed, things with limited physical qualities can't give, give, the, give themselves these limitations. There must be something external to them that gave rise to those limitations. So the universe is definitely not independent. It's definitely not necessary from that point of view. So the first option is not an intellectual option. Second option. The universe and all that we perceive depends for its existence on something else which is also dependent. Why is this not a rational explanation? So let me repeat the potential option here. The universe, all that we perceive, depends for its existence on something else which is also dependent. Why is this not a feasible intellectual option, solution? Well, think about it. See, if this universe was dependent on another universe, and that universe was dependent on another universe, and that universe was also dependent on something dependent, which is another universe. And that went on forever. We have an infinite regress of dependencies. Will we ever have our universe? Think about it. If there is an infinite regress of dependencies, we will never have our universe. If I said to this brother, can you please help me hold this book? It's too heavy, right? But before he holds the book, he has to ask his dad for permission. He's dependent on his father's permission. But before his father can give his son permission, his father also has to ask his father for permission. If that goes on forever, will he ever help me hold this book? No. Similarly with the universe, if this universe is dependent on another universe, which is also dependent on another universe, and that goes on forever, you have an infinite regress of dependencies, you never have the universe in the first place. So it basically is impossible that the universe is dependent on something else dependent forever. Now you may argue, well, it could be that the universe is dependent on something else dependent and then it stops somewhere. Fine, we don't have a problem with this. Even in Islamic theology, some interpretations of Islamic theology before the cosmos and the universe, there was smoke. So there was something that the universe was dependent on. We don't have a problem on that. What we're saying is, it stops at something independent. The ultimate explanation cannot be that the universe was ultimately dependent on something dependent. No! Somewhere along the line, there must have been something that is independent. So, the only way, brothers and sisters and friends, to explain things that are dependent is by referring to something that is not dependent and therefore necessary. 
So what's very important is this, what's very important is this, that it leads to the conclusion that the universe is as a result of something that's independent. Not only is the universe explained by something independent, that it's dependent on something independent, but that independent thing has to be eternal. Because if it wasn't eternal, it's finite. If something is finite, it requires an explanation, therefore it's not independent anymore. So you have an independent eternal thing that the universe is dependent on. Even if the universe was eternal, no problem. The argument still works. Even if you were to say, yeah, but the universe is eternal, no problem. Something could be eternal, but still be dependent. Take for example, an eternal chain of parents and children. There's an eternal chain of parents, children, parents, children, parents, children. Eternal chain. It's eternal. There's nothing independent about that chain. Because you could go to each part of the chain and ask, how did that child come into existence? Why is that child there? What's that mother doing there? Why is that father there? Could that father have been another father? Could have been. There's nothing necessary about his fatherhood. There's nothing necessary about her motherhood. There's nothing necessary about this child being born in this chain, in this eternal chain of family. Right? Also, they have limited physical qualities. They didn't give rise to those limitations themselves. There must be something external to them that gave rise to those limitations. So even if that chain was eternal, there are aspects of that chain that still give us really good reasons to believe that it's dependent. So whether the universe is eternal or not is irrelevant. The fact, that is, the fact is that even if it was eternal, it is still dependent. So, all that we sense and perceive depends for its existence on something else that exists on its own nature, that is independent and it is eternal. Let me explain why again. Number one, it has to be in independent because if it were dependent, it would also require an explanation and we're going back to the same problem. Number two, it has to be eternal because if it was not eternal, it's finite and we know finite things are dependent because finite things Things that begin, things have finite limitations, they require an explanation. This is in line with what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says about Himself in the Quran. When Allah says, Allah is independent of all that exists. Allah, God is independent of all that exists. Allah also says in the Quran, O mankind, it is you stand in need of Allah. Whereas he alone is self-sufficient, al ghani he is rich, independent. The one whom all praise is due. Now Ibn Kathir, the classical commentator, he said, They need him in all that they do, but he has no need of them at all. He is unique in his being, free of all needs, and has no partner or associate. And this is very important for us to understand, brothers and sisters and friends. Also, the famous surah in the Quran, when Allah says, Qul, who Allahu Ahad. Allah say Allah is uniquely one. Uniquely one. Allahu Samad. And He is self sufficient. This word self sufficient is a very profound word in the Arabic language. Not only does it mean self sufficient, not only does it have connotations of it of God being independent, but also God being indivisible, free of any need, being necessary, existing. That one word is a summary of everything that we said. Now, finally, before we end, there are some contentions from our beloved brothers and sisters in humanity when we talk about this argument. And the first contention is, well, maybe the universe exists independently. The universe is necessary. Well, this is not a valid contention, we know this, because when we understand what the word dependent means in this context, and we apply it to the universe, we know the universe could have been different, it could have not existed, and it could have existed in a totally different way. The fundamental building blocks of the universe have a specific arrangement in some form. There must have been something that specified that arrangement. The universe is full of limited dependent things. The universe is full of things that have limited physical qualities. Those things can't give rise to their own limitations. Therefore, there must have been an external set of factors that gave rise to those limitations. So we see that the universe doesn't exist independently from that point of view. 
The second contention is a contention that you hear from the 1960s, I believe, from the grandfather of neo-atheism, Bertrand Russell. I think it was on a radio debate and program on the BBC. He said, get over it. The universe is a brute fact. You'll have no explanation. Ignore it. And the, the minute you ignore it, you'll have a better life. I'm just summarizing the kind of uh, understanding here. Now that's false. Because think about this. Imagine we are... We go to the park. What's the nearest park here? Cambridge Park? Kelsey Park. Parker Space is called. That's an interesting name for a park. Parker Space. So we go to Parker Space and we're playing and all of a sudden we see a hovering green ball. It's hovering. There's a hovering green ball. Do you look at the ball and we say, ah, look at that hovering green ball. It exists independently. It's necessarily existing. Its existence explains itself. Is that what we say? No. What do we say? How, did it, how is that happening? We need an explanation for this hovering green ball. Because it has limited physical qualities, it requires an explanation, there's nothing necessary about its existence, it could have been arranged in a different way, it didn't have to be there at all, so we're applying this understanding of dependency on the hovering green ball. Right? Rightly so. Okay, get that ball, now make it into the size of Jupiter. Same questions apply, right? Now get that ball, make it to the size of the universe. Same questions apply, right? So how can you say the universe is a brute fact? <laughs> and what's very interesting, for you to say this, you undermine science. Because there's a whole field of science trying to answer the question, why is the universe the way, is the way that it is? It's called cosmology. That contention is absurd, because if you apply it consistently, give up your science, give up your philosophy, <laughs> Third contention, the final one, and you always hear this, Hamza, this is a typical theist argument, it's called God of the gaps. You don't know about the science of the universe, you're primitive in your understanding, or we're primitive in our understanding, there is a gap in scientific knowledge, so you squeeze God in there as an explanation. You hear this all the time, it is the most overused, outdated, atheist cliche all the time. It's so overused. This has nothing to do with science. This argument loves science. It says, Ahlan wa sahlan, welcome science. You could bring anything. Say there are 50 universes. Say there are a million universes. Say there are multiverses, many, many universes. We don't have a problem. Say there are different laws of physics. Say whatever you want. But the minute you bring science is the minute that this argument still absorbs it. Why? Because anything you bring scientifically is always going to be dependent. In actual fact, science can never discover something independent by the nature of the method of science. Because as Professor Elliot Sober, an atheist, philosopher of science, uh, he's a philosopher of science, he says scientists are restricted to the observations they have at hand. One of the key methodological restrictions of science is what? Observation. If you observe something, what you observe is going to be independent or dependent? It's going to be dependent. Because anything you observe is going to have limited physical qualities. It's impossible from our limited senses to observe something that doesn't have limited physical qualities. <laughs> so that's the point. So any science you bring, you could, you could couch in any scientific language. Use any complex terms. Multiverse, many worlds model, whatever you want, our argument still stands. Because those things will still be dependent by the definition that we just discussed. So it's not God of the gaps at all. It's prior to science. Bring any science involved, we don't have a problem. We don't have any problem. We will still require an explanation for what you will bring. Is it dependent or independent? It's dependent. How do you explain that dependency? What we've just discussed is ultimately it's explained by an independent and eternal being. And that's best explained by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, finally, I want to make this a little bit more spiritual, obviously. And I want to read you the final story. It's going to take two, three minutes. And it really summarizes, once we understand this intellectual gymnastics, 
it has to profoundly affect our hearts. Because when you study the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when Allah talks about man life and the universe and the material physical world and the cosmos and the creatures, these aspects of his rububiyyah, these aspects of his creative power, are there for us to conclude what? To conclude al-ibadah. To conclude that Allah deserves worship. This is so important for us to understand. That from understanding the creative power, the creative divine power in the universe, it has to now make us understand Allah's exclusivity concerning His divinity. Allah's exclusivity concerning His divinity that He, de he deserves all worship. This is important. If you don't get this at the end, what I've said is rubbish. What I've said is trash. You have to understand that logical link. The minute we understand Allah is a self-evident truth, the minute we understand that Allah is the explanation for everything dependent, He's an independent being and eternal, the minute you understand this, therefore you should worship Him. Why? Because everything that you do is dependent on whom? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Therefore, He deserves our gratitude. And gratitude is an expression of worship. Study the Quran. Surah Al-Fatiha. The seven verses. The mother of the book. The ulama say Surah Al-Fatiha explains the whole of the Quran. What is the pillar of the Quran? Tawheed. Singling out Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for worship. And what's the first line of Surah Al-Fatiha? What does Allah say? Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. All perfect, exclusive gratitude belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Why? Why? Well, let's read this story that links to the argument I've just spoken about. And this story is by Gay Eaton. One day, I set out to tend my fields, accompanied by my little dog, sworn enemy of the monkeys which ravaged the plantations. It was the season of the great heat. My dog and I were so hot that we could scarcely breathe. I began to think that one or other of us would soon fall in a faint. Then, thank God, I saw a tiaki tree, the branches of which presented a vault of refreshing greenery. My dog gave little cries of joy and turned towards this blessed shade. When he had reached the shade, instead of staying where he was, he came back to me, his tongue out. Seeing how his flanks were palpitating, I realized how completely exhausted he was. I walked towards the shade. My dog was full of joy. Then, for a moment, I pretended to continue on my way. The poor beast groaned plaintively, but followed me nonetheless, his tail between his legs. He was obviously in despair, but determined to follow me, whatever might come of it. This fidelity moved me profoundly. How could one fully appreciate the readiness of this animal to follow me, even to death, although he was under no constraint to do so? He was devoted to me, as I said to myself, because he regards me as his master, so he risks his life simply to stay beside me. Oh my Lord, I cried, heal my troubled soul, my fidelity, like that of this being whom I call contemptuously a dog. Give me, as you have given him, the strength to master my life so that I may accomplish your will and follow without asking. Where am I going? The path upon which you guide me. I am not the creator of this dog, yet he follows me in docility at the cost of a thousand sufferings. It is you, Lord, who has gifted him with this virtue. Give, O oh my Lord, to all who ask of it, you as I do, the virtue of love and the courage of charity. Then I retrace my steps and took refuge in the shade. Full of joy, my little companion lay down facing me so that his eyes were turned to mine as though he wished to speak seriously to me. Brothers and sisters and friends, our master is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
But do we act as the dog acts to its own owner that considers that it considers its master? The dog and the owner and everything else is dependent solely on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And therefore our whole being should be attached to Allah and be grateful to Him. And this gratitude is not Him giving you a house. And this gratitude is not Him giving you a car or more children. These are bonuses. We have become so ungrateful that we think only to be grateful if I pass my exams. I'm only grateful if He gives me food. I'm only grateful if He gives me a little bit more money. I'm only grateful if He gives me a house and a wife and a child. This is, not, this is a bonus. This is a bonus. Wallahi brothers and sisters, this is a bonus. Reflect on the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When Allah says you cannot enumerate, you cannot count the blessings of Allah. You cannot count them. And I wanted to find an example for people who are sad, suffering or even happy. For everybody. And what is this blessing? It's life itself. It's so priceless and precious. We don't own it. We don't earn it. We don't deserve it. But we receive every moment of our existence for free. And it's priceless. We receive this gift of life. That even if you were a multi-billionaire and you had 10 minutes left to live, and if I said to you, give me all of your wealth for 10 more years, you will give me all of your wealth. Ask any millionaire who's blind. They would say, I'll give you all my wealth just to see my mother. We're ungrateful people. We are un become ungrateful. And the basis of our life from a physical point of view is the heartbeat. This heartbeat, brothers and sisters, is the asbab, is the sabab, is the cause that Allah has created in order to keep us alive. Your heartbeat that you're not even conscious of. Just listen to your heartbeat. Tell it to stop, it won't stop. Tell it to go faster, it won't go faster. It's independent of your conscious control. If this heartbeat were to stop, you won't have life anymore. It's finished. If I said to you, you had a hundred heartbeats left, and in order to get another thousand heartbeats, you give me a million pounds, you would do whatever it takes to find that money. Here's the challenge. The challenge from the Quran. You cannot enumerate, count Allah's blessings. And I dare you try and compete with this challenge. Count all the heartbeats you've had so far. It's physically impossible. For the first three years, you don't even know how to count. You got three years backlog. When you're sleeping, you have backlog. In actual fact, it is physically impossible for a human being to count and enumerate every single heartbeat they'll have in their lifetime. So it's true. You can never count the blessings of Allah. And this is the one small blessing, which is the physical reason that Allah has given us for your own life and existence. The heartbeat. Imagine anything else. And that's why I say to my family, anything above a heartbeat is a bonus. Uqsum Billah, by Allah, if you had this mindset, you would never be sad. The believer would never be sad if they had this mindset. They would always wake up and be grateful for life. Because it's not theirs, it's a gift. They would always be grateful for this heartbeat that they can't even count.